Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Man, we miss you guys. We miss you guys a lot. Are there people out in the parking lot? Honk? I think there are. You can honk your horn like amen or something like that if you want to. Um, so they're on the parking lot sitting just to try and get closer. Um, we've been doing our very best to try and reach out to you guys and make ways for us to connect. And um, if you are missing those opportunities, please let us know. Um, I can just let you know that there's been a lot of effort, a lot of energy has gone into trying to bring uh, us together. So um, I want to tell you about a few of those things and then we can, um, we'll get into our study here in just a moment. But let me make a, a few announcements. Um, so this is the second week now. Um, and <clears throat> this coming Wednesday will be the same. It'll be a live stream um, set up, not regular attending the church. Um, but this coming Monday, there's expected to be a, an update with new guidelines um, or modified guidelines from the White House and then on to, the, um, to each state, and they can make the decisions of how they want to um, handle this situation. So w we're not going to make an announcement until we hear from them and we get that update. So um, just know that we'll be sending out an email to you and um, notifying in different ways. You can always call the church office. Um, so for this morning's uh, message, I already have some worship, going to have teaching. Um, parents, uh, there's a ch on our website, if you go to cclberg.com slash stay connected, and that's kind of what we've done. Everything that's related to what we're doing right now in this season is kind of uh, in that place, cclberg.com slash stay connected. Um, parents, you can download the, the lesson and the teacher's guide. Um, for that, your children and the age appropriate, um, you know, lessons are there. So we're wanting you to be able to just have another tool in your hand of how you can be ministering to your kids and um, just having having church at, how, at your house. And so um, have a, have fun with it, have a good time with it, and just invest. I'm sure it's perfectly easy to do that. I know it always was when we did devotions in our house. It was so orderly, it was so calm. All the kids just got quiet and angelic faces and. Nobody bothered each other, so I'm sure it's the same way in your house. Uh, so we're praying for you. Um, next, um, th we're going to have a prayer meeting tonight um, through a, uh, we're using a platform called Zoom, so we're not going to be here at the building, but uh, from 6 to 7, um, you can join. Now, I don't, I'm not sure if it's up there yet, but it will be up soon. Again, go to cclberg.com slash stay connected. And there'll be a place for you to click on um, a, a link, and you can download the software. Also going to be sending out an email um, to you. So if you're in the communications group, you'll get the email that will give you the meeting um, link. You can just click on that. And so we're going to have, a, we're gonna, you know, have uh, if we have hundreds of people that do this, it's okay, because we'll be able to break into um, small groups um, through Zoom. So um, we're going to do that from 6 to 7, just praying. Um, uh, also, I know that the home fellowships all met this past week. I know that um, there are other meetings, like the youth had meetings and so forth. Um, so if you are wanting to be a part of a small group through um, online home, fe home fellowship, again, same thing, go to cclberg.com slash stay connected. If you're already in a home fellowship, you know about this. But if you're not, and you're just, hopefully you're missing connection with people, um, go ahead and do that. I, I overheard the uh, home fellowship leaders uh, this morning talking about how it went this past week, and all of them said it went really well. So um, if you're whole, thinking, ah, that's just not personal enough, give it a try. Um, you know, obviously face-to-face -face is better. Nobody's going to challenge that. But this is an opportunity for us to do what we can do under these circumstances. Um, let's see. Um, so I keep mentioning about the... Uh, uh, the emails that go out, if you need to get signed up for that email, go to cclberg.com slash stay connected. You'll see a link there. And then also there is a, <clears throat> there's a link on that same page, cclberg.com slash stay connected to do an online giving. Or if you need to uh, mail in your check, you can do that. And I realize probably a lot of you don't even know our address at this point, being that we're over here and it's new, but it's 20722. Timberlake Road, Suite 5, and it's 24502 Lynchburg. So 20722 Timberlake Road, Suite 5. And um, so we'll, we'll, 
we'll receive that as worship uh, to the Lord, just like the songs we've been singing. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, <clears throat> and then we're going to get into our study. Father, we are grateful that um, even in these um, less than ideal circumstances, you've provided these different platforms uh, for us to be able to hold service and connect. And I just pray that it would be sweet, Lord, in each of the living rooms, in each of the cars, wherever people may be um, watching and listening. Lord, may you be ministering to their heart. May you be strengthening them. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you give us um, this opportunity, and we pray that we would be faithful stewards of the time that we have, maybe extra time that we have in our homes. Help us to redeem it. As we give back to you with our offerings this morning, Father, we do this as a matter of worship. We give it to you and ask that you continue to give us wisdom and guidance to use these things for your glory, for your, wis for, for your honor, and that we would have wisdom to distribute them, um, Lord, because we know that this is yours. Oh Lord, we just are, we want to pray for our leaders. We want to pray for um, those that are making decisions about how to care for people, those that are doing research, those that are um, making decisions. Lord, a lot of power has been placed in their hands. We pray that these men and women would uh, be just filled with your spirit. Um, Lord, drawing them first and foremost to yourself, but then using their giftedness, their talents, and um, we pray for those that are sick. Lord, we pray for those that are struggling. Um, and we know it's not just people that have this COVID-19. There's people that have cancer. There's people that are, are dealing with other challenges in their bodies. Be near to them, strengthening them, um, and, and keeping them safe, Lord, through the midst of all this. So our eyes are on you. Our heart is set upon you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Well, um, <laughs> I'm going to, again, break from where we w would have been. We were, we're going through the pastoral epistle, 1 Timothy. And again, it just doesn't, doesn't seem quite appropriate to bring the message on, um, on that right at this time. We'll get to that. Um, if it tarries long in this kind of a format, we will pick that up. But again, just as I prayed through it, I wanted to maybe address the kind of the season that we are in right now. Um, and hopefully just put forth some encouraging word that we are all familiar with. So turn with me to James chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 2 through 12 this morning. 2 through 12. And the title is, How to Walk Through a Trial. How to Walk Through a Trial. Last week we studied Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, and how in a moment of crisis, national crisis, uh, people of Ammon and Moab were coming to attack them, and they got word of this attack when the army was only 50 miles from, from Jerusalem. And Jehoshaphat calls people together, women and children, and they go to the temple and says, Lord, we don't know what to do. We have no strength. We have no power. But we know to call upon you. And so they called upon him, and the Lord gave them such a, an incredible victory. And I pray that you, you found encouragement in this, this past week, that there's encouragement, there's strength for you in the Lord. And you don't have to know what to do, and you don't have to have power, you just have to know who to call upon. And who we call upon is the Lord. Well, this morning, I want to be reminded in my own life, in my own family, and then us as the family of God, of how do we walk through a trial? And so James chapter 1, we begin at verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a, a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the, verse 9, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat that it withers, the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. 
Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So how to face a trial. And let me just say this. I forgot to say this at the beginning. Following um, my teaching portion here, so in about a, a half an hour or so, um, we're going to have, again, the panel of uh, staff people and wives up here, um, and we're going to, uh, I got some questions prepared, all kinds of trick questions. They think they know what I'm going to ask, but I've changed them all. And um, it's going to be trick questions on, on trials. And, but we want you to actually begin to uh, send in your questions. And somebody's going to, you can do that through Facebook, um, or you can do that on our, um, um, through cclberg.com slash live stream. There's a place for you to put questions in there. So um, we, we look forward to, we got those last week, and we look forward to getting them again this week. But let's begin here. Six points that I want us to see of how we walk through a trial. Number one, it's found in verse two, that is, we must remain faithful. We are exhorted, we are encouraged to be joyful in trials. Now this is not something that our flesh is inclined to do. In a trial, when everything uh, gets hard and difficult, the true north of our flesh is not to go, well, praise the Lord. He's in control. Now, that, that's an unnatural thing to do, but we are not natural people. We are those that have been redeemed by the Lord. And so the supernatural, natural response for the believer is, verse 2, is to count it all joy. But how do you respond when the trial comes in? A better question is this. How does Troy respond when a trial comes in? Well, sometimes I pass and sometimes I fail. But th this is the key, and, and this is a quote that's from John Phillips. And he says, when trials come, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. How do you respond when the trials come? Is it some unwelcome guest that you want to get out of your life as soon as possible? Or do you recognize that that event in your life is something that the Lord is working in your heart to produce something good? Now, we read here that we should count it all joy. And the word count is a word that speaks of careful and deliberate judgment. I like that. It's, it means to engage in an intellectual process because your emotions are not going to do this, all right? Your, your emotions aren't just going to light up and just say, woo, joy. It's going to be something that actually is an intellectual process with that redeemed mind that you have uh, taught and instructed by the Word of God and the Spirit of God leading you that you will have to in that way, count it all joy. So when we read count it all joy, if you, if you hear, well, allow the emotion of joy just to kind of bubble up and overwhelm you, you're going to be sorely disappointed. That's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is you're going to have to count it. That is, you're going to have to give a deliberate um, effort to think properly about these circumstances. So, as one author says, this is a verb of thought rather than a verb of emotion. A verb of thought rather than emotion. It, James is not commanding how one should feel, but he is rather telling us how we should think about our circumstances. I, I think I find that very helpful because, again, if we, are all, if we hear joy and we lock in on this emotional level of like happiness and giddiness, it's not going to make a lot of sense. But what he is saying is that with our redeemed minds, we need to make a proper evaluation of these things. So responding with joy is a deliberate, purposeful act that each of us are to engage in. Still there in verse 2, talking about uh, how we carry out trials, walk out trials, is that we need to be joyful. He says there that we should count it how much joy? All joy. And actually, the word for all joy, you could have the idea of, of pure joy. In other words, there's nothing else. There's no other mixture of attitude. There's not despair. There's not grief. There's not complaint. There's not anger. There's not Troy Warner irritability over the circumstances. That's where I find 
I have to constantly repent as I get irritated over these things that come in. So it's not joy and irritation. It's not joy and despair. It's not joy and grief. It's something that I say, all right, Lord, I'm going to turn this over to you. One author defines joy as this, a settled contentment in every situation or an unnatural reaction of deep, steady, and unadulterated thankful trust in God. And that is what we are being called to do. A deep sense of well-being that on uh, one, ha- one hand can embrace sorrow, tears and laughter, anger and pain, but you're able to bring them all in at the same time. You feel these things, but there's a, a, a deep sense of joy in the midst of all this. Again, joy is the decision that we're being exhorted to have, not a feeling. So important for us to know. So how is your joy doing? How is that joyful response, that pure joy doing in the trials that you're facing? Now, listen, we can easily, and as I teach, I've had this in my mind, I could easily begin to only address the current uh, pandemic situation and the uh, ramifications of that, which I know all of us are feeling on one level or another. Even if you're personal life is okay. You know other people that are out of work, or you know people that are panicked, or you know people that are, um, you know, having to go through changes, unable to travel, uh, businesses facing difficulty. Um, So that is certainly something we're going through. But there's all, I mean, life continues on with all of its other stuff, with all of its other challenges. Those things were not put on pause because this happened. So it can be any type of Uh, trial that we are facing. Um, So how is that joy coming along? The Lord wants you, he wants me, he wants us to begin to rejoice, to have joy in the midst of whatever our trials are. He says that we, to count it pure joy um, for the trials that we fall into. Uh, Still there in verse Two towards the end. So it's when you fall into various trials. The idea of fall means to be surrounded by. You're, you're, you fall into something and you're surrounded by it. Um, uh, one uh, uh, Athenian historian used this actual word to describe a plague that broke out in Athens and he used this idea of fall. They fell into a plague. So it's the idea that's just all around you. I think we can, we can get that idea right now. It's like the pandemic. It's like what part of life is not affected right now? Very few. So it's, a, it's something that's surrounding you. It isn't just something that is over here and um, is a minor, minor irritation. He's talking about things that are they're encompassing your life. They're engulfing your life. I think it's important for us to understand that because it's not just annoying things and, well, we can count those as joy, but, <clears throat> you know, the real challenges, the real hard stuff of life that are overwhelming us, this doesn't apply. No, it actually applies perfectly. It's, so again, the idea of fall here is falling into something which surrounds you. What is it that's surrounding you? When trials come, they do often feel like a siege, don't they? They're, they're like, they come at you and they hit all of your senses at once. And again, the natural is not a sense of well-being, but it could be fear or panic or anger. But even in circumstances like this, we are called to be full of joy, to count it all joy. So number one point, how do we face trials? We count it deliberate act of our mind, pure joy. That's, that's what we're going for. So, but why would we do that? Now, as we move into verse 3, we give the, we're given the cause for the joy that we would go through, that we should have in the midst of the trials we're going through. So verse 3 says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So I need to know that God is developing character. He's giving me the endurance that I need So I need to know that God is working on me. He's making me a a man. He's making you a woman of character that's going to have patience, 
Trials come to test our faith. And in those trials, we discover what substance we are made of in our walk with the Lord. Is it gold? Is it a uh, precious gems that uh, is, is marking our life and our character? Well, when trials come, you're going to see that you'll see that manifested. And I don't think this is arrogance. I don't think this is pride. You probably have been, maybe sometimes you've even been kind of surprised at yourself. Like, wow, I can't believe I handled that so well. Well, don't get too many pats on your back there. The, it's the Lord's grace in your life. But, but it's like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of surprised. Well, that's, that's the evidence of God's work in your life. So trials prove who we are in the faith. Trials, listen to this, are not meant to destroy, but to inform. Who are you? Well, you'll find out in a trial, won't you? Trials are the Christian's occasion to be approved. It's not a time to cause us to fall. God wants us to, be, to, to shine forth in a, in a glorious way, like Job did. I mean, the trials for Job weren't to destroy him. It was to prove in that spiritual realm, who he was. So knowing that the testing of your faith pr produces patience. Patience. The testing isn't so God can get an insight on you. He already has all the insights that he needs to know. And I'll give you a reference. John 6, verses 5 through 6 said, Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus is, has full information, but it's a test for them. The trial was, how are you going to feed all of these people? Well, our best plan is to send them all away. <laughs> okay, well, we're not going to do that. So what's plan B? Um, we don't know. All we know is we've got a problem. We've got a, a, just a handful of, of fish and a couple of loaves of bread. We're, we're out of luck. Well, why don't you just go have them sit down, and I'll show you what I'm going to do. The Lord knew what he was going to do. You going through God is not disappointed by what he finds out in your life through the trial. He already knows what's in your life. He's not like, heaven is not like, whoa, didn't know that about Troy. Didn't know that about Rebecca. We thought, we kind of thought better about them. Now that might happen with us, but it doesn't happen with the Lord. He knows who we are. So the trials help us. It, it can affirm that we are moving in the right direction or it can reveal to us, you need to work on this. This is where you need to uh, spend time. Now, we can often be like Peter who says, Lord, I am more mature and I am more steadfast than these other 11 disciples. And I realize you probably can't count on them, but you can totally count on me. Because if everybody betrays you, I will be there. I'm the guy that walks on water. I'm the guy that gets revelations. Remember, you can count on me. Well, what happened? Well, the trial came and, and Peter denied the Lord three times. So uh, what happened to Peter? Did he backslide? No. We just found out where he was already sliding, <laughs> okay? It, we found out where he was in his walk and where he needed to, to grow. In this trial, or the next one that comes to examine your faith, you'll have need of the Lord's strength in your life. And we can put too much dependence on, on other things. So if we've been... Um, a lot of people are very you know, dependent on their ability and their marketing skills and their business you know, acumen. And uh, okay, I know how to deal with these other people. Who don't Well, maybe suddenly all those things have changed. And now you're seeing something. It's like, wow, I've had too much dependence on something else. So this current trial reveals or somebody cuts you off on the road and it reveals what kind of character you have. You run across that person, you get an email, you get a text from somebody, their name comes up in a conversation, and you thought you've dealt with your heart towards them, but now all of a sudden, the testing has revealed, and you see the bitterness there, and it becomes uncovered. So trials, it shows what's there. That testing, it, it says, all right, this is, here's the gold, but boy, here's all the dross, and that testing that this is what needs 
to come out, um, come out of your life. So God is wanting to produce patience in your life. This is what we read here. We should rejoice because we know that God is testing our faith and he's producing patience. Well, patience is an important thing. Patience is the ability, the capacity to hold up under difficult circumstances. And we need that. We need to have strength uh, to be able to stand up. And, you know, maybe this current trial, you're seeing the weaknesses, you're seeing things that need to be changed, and you're, you begin to address them, you begin to set your attention on them, and then you come along and you can begin to uh, grow and to mature so that the next time a trial comes, or even a more difficult trial, you'll be ready, you'll be, you'll be prepared for that difficulty. So what is meant by having patience? It is the quality of remaining loyal to God in the face of hostility. That is patience. So how would that happen? How, how would I become disloyal to God in a trial? Well, if my business begins to fail or my marriage begins to struggle or my emotions begin to um, you know, be affected more or my health begins to uh, be impacted, um, many people, sadly, at that point in time, say, oh, I'm not, uh, forget it. If God could change this if he wanted to and he didn't change these things, so I'm walking away. So what God does is he is at work in our life to produce patience in us so that we can have endurance, we can have steadfastness, we can have a fortitude. And that is what is needed in this life as we walk with the Lord, that we can be loyal all the days of our life. It's a quality that's needed by all Christians when we face temptation or persecution. We need patience. We need endurance that we would not flinch. It is a lack of patience or endurance that has caused some of the greatest heroes of the Bible to fail. Abraham lacked patience and he went in with Hagar to get a son. Moses lacked patience in watching God deliver um, uh, Israel out from the hand of Egypt and he killed an Egyptian. David faltered because he lacked steadfastness on his race of holiness, on the course of holiness. And so it's when we lack patience that failure comes in. Whether it's waiting for God to act or remaining steadfast in your pursuit of Jesus Christ, trials work to produce fortitude so that you can endure. We are familiar with Romans 8.28 that tells us that he's causing all things to work together for good. God is working in all of our circumstances. So as believers, we can, we can rejoice in this. God is active in my life. Closely related to this, the third point is that, found in verse 4, is that know that God is making you mature. So it's, it's very similar. It says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. Let patience. You have to submit to the trial to produce in you the patience that is needed. We need to make certain that we're not walking out and saying, forget it, I'm just checking out because of these trials. L look what's offered. It's patience in verse 3. But if someone was to come to you and says, I know a sure way that you can be perfect, you can be complete. And the word perfect is the idea of mature. I know a way that you can be mature, that you can be complete, and that you would lack nothing. Are you interested? Of course. Who wouldn't be interested in these things? Well, the Lord will use the trials of our life to produce these desirable qualities. It will make us mature, make us complete. So when he says, let patience have its perfect work, think of it this way. Don't tamper with the process. <laughs> don't, don't put your hand into that process and begin to undo and try and run out from underneath something that God is using in your life to produce patience and to produce maturity. We need to submit ourselves to the course work of trials. You register for a class, you sign up to do the assigned homework. 
And this is what we need to do. You're in, a, you're in you know, trials 101, 201, 301, 401. I don't know. Maybe some of you are in 701. You know, you're doing, you're writing your doctoral thesis on, on, on this trial right now. Well, make certain that you fulfill the requirements of that course. And that is that you would rejoice and let God work in your life. And that it's a benefit. It's, it's hard at the moment when you're reading and writing and studying and answering questions. But when you're done with it, you walk away with this knowledge base. Warren Wiersbe says this. If we value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us. If we value the material and physical more than the spiritual, we will not be able to count it all joy. If we live only for the present and forget the future, then trials will make us bitter, not better. So learn what the Lord, the Lord is trying to teach you in the midst of this challenge. We will only arrive at maturity as we face difficulties and challenges and walk forward. So think in your own life the things that you've gone through in the past that have made you ready for what you're enduring right now. For some of you, as we go through this, this trial, you've been out of work before. You've seen you know, financial struggle before. And you're like, you know what? I'm not going to worry about this because I know God has always provided for me and I know that he's going to provide again. And you can trust in the Lord in this way. So this is why we rejoice, right? Because God's at work in my life. He's at work in my life, giving me patience so that I can live out the Christian life to the end of the days uh, of my walk. And he's also making me mature. I rejoice for what God is doing in my life right here, right now. I'm not giddy about the trial. I'm not, you know, um, some emotionally elated person because I found out there's sickness in my family. No, it's I am glad for what God is going to do. And what is God going to do? He's going to give you patience. He's going to give you fortitude. He's going to give you endurance. And he's going to make you mature. And he's going to make you perfect, lacking nothing. This is why we rejoice. Let's move on to verse 5. It says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. So our next point is that we face trial, as we face trials, we need to look to God for wisdom. I mean, what's the number one question we ask when we go through a trial? Why? Why is this happening? Very rarely do we ever get the answer of the specifics. But God will give us wisdom on how to walk through the trial. Trials bring up many questions, and it's during those seasons that we need to find our answers and our way and direction from God. You can have all kinds of knowledge about a subject, but when you're faced with uh, you know, a trial, when you're in the, you know, the battle and the bullets are fall, uh, flying, you don't want a person with knowledge. You want a person with wisdom. You don't want them to have to be thinking through and discover. You don't want them on Google trying to figure it out. You want somebody that has wisdom. They know how to apply the knowledge that they already have. And the Lord wants to give us wisdom for the things that we're going through. So we wait. We wait upon the Lord and we look to him. Lord, I'm in the midst of this difficulty. I'm in the midst of this trial. How then should I behave? How then should I conduct myself? And the Lord will give you wisdom. But I want you to see this. So often when trials hit our life, where we end up running is not to the Lord and saying, Lord, what are you doing and what do I need to know? We end up running to the world. We go to this blog. We go to Oprah. We go here. We go there. But we need to go to godly people and we need to go to, to the Lord himself first and foremost, to his word and say, Lord, how do you want me to behave? How do you want me to conduct myself? So we should look to God for wisdom. If you're looking out in the world for solutions, you're looking in the wrong place. We often go back and forth between dependence on God and independence. And where the Lord wants us to be is dependent upon Him. And sometimes the trials become so great, we have no other choice. It's kind of in those 
uh, mid-level trials where we think, well, I can handle this, or, you know, we can handle, I'll figure this one out, we'll just endure. Wait a minute. We need to be looking to the Lord for the big and the small challenges. Do you believe God will give you wisdom? And do you believe the wisdom he's going to give you is right? That when you hear the wisdom, that you'll walk it out. I just don't know what to do in this relationship. This person has offended me. Oh, okay, well, here's wisdom. Go and let that person know that they've offended you and try to win them back as a brother in the Lord, a sister in the Lord. Yeah, but you know, I think right now is just not a good time. Okay, so you don't want God's wisdom. This is what God says, and now you're going to negotiate with what he says. And, and I think that leads us into this next, next piece, is that we need to have faith. But let him ask, verse 6, let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he, he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So we are to be people of faith. But it's faith that makes me ask God for wisdom. It's, it's me believing that in my circumstances, as I call upon the Lord, that he's going to give me the right thing to do. And that is an exercise of faith. But we are given this further instruction is make certain you don't doubt. And one aspect of doubting is when the answer comes, you start to negotiate the word of God. You start to negotiate that wisdom that somebody has spoken to you about how to handle these circumstances. And you begin to think, is this really going to work out? Well, I know God's word says this, but... No, there's no but. If you want to be found um, in error, be found in the error of trusting in the word of God too much, as if that's possible. Don't be found in the places, well, I gave it a shot and then I tr decided to try my own things. No, that's not having faith. And, and the Lord knows. I mean, if you want to come in and, and, well, what does the Lord have to say about this? And yet you already have it made up in your mind the Lord's not going to give you wisdom. He's not going to give you specifics. It's like, well, I've got this and this is what I'm going to do. Well, that's not really coming and asking God for wisdom. So we need to be a people of faith. God bless you. You're welcome. And so faith is an important part of our answered prayers. I believe God's going to work. And as I believe, wow, the prayer is answered and I, I'm able to say, this is how I should walk. But it's not just faith um, that God is going to give wisdom, but it's faith that God is working in me in a spiritual way. Sometimes we begin to think that God's not involved in my life. He is involved in your life. And the more trials you have, the more um, evidence you have. I'm not saying he's more involved. I'm just saying the more evidence you have, the more trials you have. That God is working and God is moving. Sometimes we have a hard time believing that trials are going to produce patience. The trials are going to actually make me into a man or a woman that looks more like Jesus. But if, it, if that is what happens, then you can understand why I would rejoice, why we're exhorted to rejoice. Well, of course I will. Last point, and then we're going to pray and I'm going to invite the team to come on up and we're going to take some of your questions. So if you haven't sent in some questions yet, Start sending them in. Um, Vernon says he has every answer on every subject, so please ask away. He's even going to explain why the Miami Hurricanes cannot win any more <laughs> championships, I think. So, anyway, verses 9, I'm still, you can ask any question. Verses 9 through 12, our last point here. Is we are to have an eternal focus. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. So we know the Lord lifts up the humble, right? But the rich in his humiliation. Well, see, you know, both of these things, situations, they're learning something. As a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. It flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Now, some say this is an unbeliever. I don't think this is an unbeliever. I think this is believers that are blessed with riches, and they're not being condemned here, but 
both the rich man and the poor man have to come to this conclusion that their focus should not be upon their present circumstances. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So here's the point. We don't look upon the difficulties that we have. We don't look upon the blessings that we have. All of it changes. The lowly is exalted. The exalted is made low. And so I don't put my trust in these circumstances. Paul put it this way in Romans 8.18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Do you see that? Not worthy. It's not worthy to be compared. And we can, we can get our minds so set on this present time and we lose that eternal focus. But when we have an eternal focus, it allows me to rejoice in my trials. You see, the first part of this passage said you can rejoice because God's at work in you right now. But now here at the close of this passage, he's saying God is going to work in you in the next life. You're going to receive this, this crown of righteousness, this crown of life that has been promised to those who love him. When we arrive in heaven, we're going to be given eternal life. We're going to be crowned with eternal life. And we're going to be able to, um, and that in this present season should cause us to not simply look at the present sufferings, but with the glory that shall come. I want to close by just reading one more passage. It's 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 8. You're familiar with it. And I'll just let these words stand on their own. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Let's pray together. Lord, we are in need of you. We're in need of the strength that you give to us, the power that you give to us to make it through the trials and the difficulties of life. And Lord, you know what each and every one of us is facing. You know things that we're going through that maybe have not been shared with anybody else, but Lord, you are fully aware of those challenges. I pray that you would give us pure joy. You give us the ability to rejoice in the work that you're going to do in our life, making us more and more like you, giving us everything we need to make it to the end of this life with faithful loyalty to your name. Lord, I pray that the hope of heaven would just be so large in our minds here this morning and as we move through this life. Lord, we all are familiar with this passage. We've studied it before. But I pray you'd help us to apply it and bring it into our lives afresh. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Well, here's here's the crowd that's going to kind of discuss this. And again, as we move through there, I've got my phone here. So texting in church is allowed today. Um, And we'd love to hear from you some of the questions. But uh, until those start to come in, we just thought we would prime, um, I'm fine, thank you. I would just prime the pump here with uh, a few questions that I'm going to put to these guys. So um, first of all, the question I want to ask is, respond to the significance of having all joy, or all joy meaning pure joy. So Vernon, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I think that's probably one of the most challenging parts of this is 
um, having that all joy and pure joy because that's not the natural response, you know, that we have is because of our, we're, we're, we have this fleshly body still. But I did like the one point you made in the message about that God's redeemed all of us and um, I brought to my mind the thing of, you know, we're a new creation in Christ. So it is possible for us to have all joy because of the Lord's work in our life and um, and just makes me want to run to him more because I know that's what I'm supposed to have, but mm-hmm. it's not possible without him. Right. So, Yeah, absolutely. Joel, any thoughts on that, that question? Yeah, I mean, um, just kind of along what with, with Werner was saying, um, count it all joy. Um, and, and you even alluded it to it in your message of, of this isn't just a, uh, it's not like an emotional type thing. It's, it's a decision. And um, through the, the spectrum of circumstances, truly we can have that joy. Um, because, you know, happiness, it's not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. You know, happiness is an emotion that we have the capacity to have. But that is contingent on circumstance. Whereas um, counting it all joy, we, we really can do that as believers um, in any circumstance. Um, it, we have to set our minds to it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Here's a question that came in. It says, is it doubt to know that God can answer my prayer, but to also be unsure that he will answer it? How do I have faith that he will answer my prayer while still respecting that he may not? I want to have strong faith while I pray without presuming God's will in my life. That's a great question. Hmm. Anybody want to answer that? You know, I think that's something that we all mm-hmm. tend to struggle with. I mean, Megan and I have had many things in our life where, where we feel like, Lord, I have no doubt that you could do this. Mm-hmm. I have no doubt that you could answer this prayer but then there's an aspect of it where that Megan and I have walked through where we kind of feel like, but I just don't think you're going to do it for me. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. and I think that that's, that's a heart issue that's, that's not good because for, I mean, just speaking for personally for Megan and I's life, because it, it shows a doubt that the Lord wants good things for me. Mm-hmm. And so just having that trust of Lord, I have this thing. I'm praying in full faith. I know that you can do this. Um, but yeah, just like the question said, but Lord, I, I, I give you, or, or you have the right, of course you have the right, you're God, to, to say no. Mm-hmm. And when, when we do that, it's not a thing of, well, Lord, it's just that you're, you don't want good things for me. It's, Lord, I, I trust that you're good, and I trust that, um, that you know better than I do. Mm you know better than I do. And so I can rest in that fact. Mm. And so there's this thing that I'm praying for, but yet, Lord, um, I know that you reserve the right to say no. And we can trust the Lord even in in the no answer. Right. Yeah, I think it's in Psalm 84, it says, the Lord withholds no good thing from those who walk Mm -hmm. uprightly. And and then actually here in the book of James too, it says that... um, that the Lord will send down his best gifts. There's, you know, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. So um, if the Lord does not bring something into our life that we're praying for, which I think this person obviously recognizes, you know, that God can do this, um, that uh, it's all right because yeah. he's got something else. And if it doesn't come into my life, then I can trust him. Yeah, I and that, trust him. another thing I was just going to say on that too, you know, in the Gospels, there's that man who comes to Jesus mm. f- um, for prayer for his child, and his child is sick, and he says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And right. so, I mean, the Lord can handle the fact that we're struggling, you know, and just be honest with him. Lord, I believe, I know, but I'm doubting, I'm struggling, Lord, help me. Yeah. And Lord's going to be faithful. He doesn't, you see there in the Gospels, he doesn't say, get away from me. <laughs> That's not the Lord's response. So, you know, the Lord can handle that and yeah. just be honest with them. So, okay. yeah. you know, the, the, the thought that I think is important to keep in mind is that we can just say to the Lord, I'm not sure what you want. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if it should be this or it should be that. And mm-hmm. so, Lord, I trust you. Um, I'm praying for your will to be done. Mm-hmm. My desire is for this. But you know what, Lord, if you want to do something else, you have freedom to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, So a few other questions have come in. 
Uh, how can we be witnesses to people using the uh, times we are in without freaking them out? <laughs> How can we uh, witness to people using the time we are in without freaking them out? Mm. Don't freak out when you talk to them. That would yeah. probably be a good way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, I, th I think just share what, share what you know. Mm -hmm. Share what you know. And, you know, there's a lot of things we don't understand about this time. Um, and so don't, don't speculate on those things that you mm -hmm. don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we know? We know that God is good. We know that God has told us to pray in times like this. Um, we're told to have peace in times like this. And then model that peace. And um, yeah, just keep, keep encouraging them, if they're a believer, to look to the Lord. If they're not a believer, um, that they can, you know, that this world is going to have many terrible things come upon it in the end of days, but that the Lord wants them mm. to be in his care and his keeping. Mm. You know, uh, one of the articles on the armor of God is that we would have feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Mm -hmm. And so as we are, um, and I think that that's twofold. We experience the peace of God and we have that firm footing, but also we use our shoes to, to advance. And so we, we go forth with the gospel and it's a gospel that brings peace. Mm -hmm. And so that should be displayed in our lives, but it, mm -hmm. it's also a gospel that brings peace to the lives of, of others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. Lots of them coming in. Um, what has helped your faith to walk stronger in trials? What's made you stronger in your trials? Well, <coughs> I'd say for me, I think, <coughs> you know, just remembering God's past faithfulness has mm -hmm. been a huge thing for me. And I was thinking about that this past week and just how, you know, how good God is that he's allowed things in my life so that I can see him work and so I can be able now to look back and see that God's been faithful and see that God is good and also knowing that I've tried to have this perspective the Lord has helped me with this just that here's an opportunity for God to work this is a chance now for God to show his faithfulness again to me and um, so that's helped me you know you. in those trials yeah, absolutely and I think the, uh, the whole um, point, really, of this whole topic is focus. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about focus. Perspective is the word you just used. And I think, you know, um, Vernon's wearing glasses. I'm wearing contact lenses. Uh, you're wearing glasses. You know, I mean, we, wear, we put these on so that we can see correctly, right? We, we in the natural can't see eye, can't see past the fifth row <laughs> very well. I can't see, um, you know, really very well without those contact lenses in us. So mm -hmm. I think for me, it's having the right focus. It's having the right way of looking at what's going mm -hmm. on when it's a trial and a hardship, um, whether it's something really small and personal or something big like this whole thing we're all dealing with. Um, but I put contact lenses in on purpose so that I can see correctly. And I think that we have to choose that vision that is um, spiritual. Instead of just looking at it very physically and going, oh my goodness, all of these things that are right in front of my face, um, uh, I need to not be looking at these things because they're natural, they're temporary as you just mm -hmm. taught. Mm -hmm. And I need to be looking at the spiritual and the eternal, mm -hmm. which is, what is who is God in this? And what is he trying to do? He's trying to work on my character. He's trying to, to um, give me that fortitude and that endurance and that strength and that witness that as I walk through this, mm -hmm. people can see Jesus and mm -hmm. what it looks like in a life, mm -hmm. you know, who is submitted to him. And so I think it's all about focus. It's, it's that eternal um, vision that we have to have. And it's through really the word of God, right? Mm -hmm. when, I, when I look through the word of God of who he is, what it declares, and um, what it says about him and what he wants to do. So it's getting an eternal focus. It's getting my, it's shifting off of what I can naturally see and getting to the eternal and the spiritual, the unseen. And that's part of the problem with all of it is it is unseen. I can't, I can't see it exactly with my physical eyes, what God is doing. It's my spiritual eyes. It's my heart. And so I have to switch to, okay, Lord, I need, I need an eternal focus. I need to know what you're doing um, now and how it's going to go into eternity, too. So. Good. Good. All right, Megan, this one. <laughs> this is, this yeah. one's for you. <laughs> okay. So Lana, who's six years old, wants to know how God got his power. Oh, hmm. that's a good question. 
<laughs> he just has it. <laughs> uh, he he didn't get his power. He didn't do something to to merit it or um, to gain it. It's not like he you know went out and conquered something and then got a bunch of power. He's just always had power. Like he, mm-hmm. and that's probably something that's really hard. It's hard for us to understand, any of us to understand, but he's always been powerful. He's mm-hmm. always been good. He's always been faithful. He's always um, loved us. And so it, he, it didn't just bubble up from somewhere mm-hmm. else. Like it's always been within himself, which is a hard thing for us to understand because most things that we have are from, well, everything that we have is it's from something else. It's been developed, else. right? Yeah. It's been developed yeah, in our lives. Yeah, it's been yeah. developed or, or given to us by somebody else, but nothing nothing has been given to God. He always has been powerful. Right. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Good question. Mm-hmm. So this is a question. It says, how can someone who battles emotional and physical damage from abuse mm-hmm. know God's not using this or any trial as judgment on them as a believer? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd like to maybe just answer that. Is I think this is a this is what the accuser of the brethren mm-hmm. loves to do. Satan, mm-hmm. who's the accuser of the brethren, mm-hmm. likes to accuse us and say, "Well, you deserve this. Mm-hmm. Well, you know this is going on because you know you didn't witness enough. You should have read your Bible yesterday, mm-hmm. and you didn't read." And I, I would just caution us in a much less significant way than this question is talking about but <laughs> sometimes it's like well I knew I was going to have a bad day because I didn't have a quiet time mm-hmm. I really mm-hmm. don't think mm-hmm. that God works that way mm-hmm. he is your heavenly father that loves you more than any earthly father more than 10,000 of the best earthly fathers from all times combined together on their mm-hmm. best day yeah. in one moment um, acting upon uh, and showing kindness to their child. So abuse happens and bad things happen, which is called sin, and sin is forbidden by God. Mm-hmm. So God never wants somebody to sin against you or for us to sin against them. Mm-hmm. So when you look at what's going on, I think just recognize, this is what I say, recognize the source of the accusation. Mm-hmm. It's coming from Satan. And, and so when Satan speaks, he belittles you. Uh, when Satan speaks, he discourages you. When Satan speaks, he sends you running from God. When God speaks, you feel drawn to him. You feel comforted. You feel peace. You feel welcomed. And so when you feel those other things going on, um, know that it's not coming from the Lord. Even in sin, I, what I just said is still true. Even in sin, God can crush you in one sense, but even in that crushing, it never sends you running away from him. It, it's, we sang that song that we are sweetly broken. And so just know that if there are these thoughts that coming into your mind, if it's making you think, well, I shouldn't even follow God, then you know it's not from the Lord. And so um, just know that that's not the way God works. God doesn't work that way. Amen. Amen. And you know, it's important for us to remember, you know, we take communion, you know, um, twice a month, Sunday and Wednesday. Um, And so that's a great reminder because we do it out of obedience. The Lord told us to do it, right? We do it to remember the blood of Christ. And when we're in a trial and if it's causing that kind of reaction, and we've all been there, we've all felt like that before. And that's why we can speak to it. And that's why the Word of God deals with it. But you know what? The blood of Christ washes you from all of your sin. And when we know that, when we're standing on that righteousness that we have in Christ, we, we can more easily reject those thoughts that come in and go, well, you're not enough. Well, yeah, I know I'm not enough. But that's why I'm under the blood of Christ. Because he is more than enough. He is absolutely equal. The blood of Christ washes all of that away. So when we can stand on that and when we know that that's our foundation, um, and remember the, the precious blood that was spilled and how um, effective it is for the clearing of our sin, oh, then we can know, mm. okay, Lord, I can try to embrace this trial with joy, knowing that it's not anything to do with who I am or who I am not, but you're going to just use it for my betterment, and it's not a punishment mm. at all. Mm-hmm. The blood of Christ, keep that for, you know, foremost in your mind and heart. That helps. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I agree with that. I mean, and, you know, um, the cross 
is, is God's once for all declaration that he loves yeah. us. Yeah. You know, the trial we're going through is not a sign of God's love for us or his lack of love for us. He's proven once for all, I love you. And, you know, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm the only one that forgets this, but John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus saying that, and who better knows the Father's love than Jesus? Yeah. And he was telling us, look, the Father loves you. And here I am. Yes. <laughs> so. Yeah. 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 Awesome. There's another question that asked to kind of define um, a, a clear definition of joy and a great example of having joy versus happiness. So joy is that deep-seated contentment that God is in control that allows me to uh, have thankfulness and worship and praise in my life. So that's the idea. The difference between, um, and then Joel, you were kind of talking about this, but the difference between happiness mm -hmm. and joy. Happiness is based upon circumstances. So when the you know, happenings aren't happening, you're not happy, right? Mm -hmm. If the happenings of your life, the circumstances are going really well, then we are happy. You know, oh, I'm so happy I was given a brand new car. Oh, I just ran into a telephone pole and I don't have insurance. I'm not happy anymore. <laughs> but, but joy is something that's not dependent upon circumstances. So it's been described this way to me before, is that um, joy is like a thermostat. It sets the temperature of the room. It sets the environment. And happiness is more like a thermometer. It reads the circumstances. It measures the circumstances. But joy is that thing that is not, um, it's not dependent upon the happenings. I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that or any other thoughts, but. Yep. Yeah. All right. Some great questions. Um, let's see here. Let me come back to this here. Um, it says, respond to that quote that I read from John Phillips. When trials come, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. But I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I preached the message today was for you. <laughs> That's one of those things that sounds really good when you say it. <laughs> when, you're, when you're outside of the trial, like, oh yeah, when it comes, I'm going to welcome it as a friend. But when you're in the midst of it, it's like, I don't, this, is, this doesn't seem friendly. Mm -hmm. um, well, and when, when you look at it from the perspective of, of God working through the trials, it, it's not, this isn't to diminish the hardness of, of some things that we go through, but mm -hmm. the hardships he uses as a tool for us to grow in so many more ways than we would otherwise. And when we view him that way, which that's not always the first way we approach it, because sometimes we do. And for me, a lot of times I think of him as intruders, but... Through those times, I've just I've learned so much about myself and the Lord, and um, He really does use them. And so, in that way, they are our friends because mm -hmm. it teaches so much more uh, us so much more about who God is and where things are lacking in our lives, mm -hmm. and where we need to trust the Lord more, and mm -hmm. attitudes that need to change, and so forth. So, I think also like you know if you have walked through a trial that's been a really long portion of time you know not just uh, not a, a week or a day or you know but like years of being in a trial um you get to experience the lord in a way that you would have never imagined and, uh, meaning like a closeness and understanding his character and and in that way, I think as you walk through trials and, and see that, that sweetness of the Lord, of knowing Him, it, the trial does become a friend in a sense. Like it, it, mm -hmm. it's, you get to experience the Lord. And um, I don't know, I, I look back on, on some trials in our lives and some that have been years long i'm still walking in a trial you know of of sorts and and watching others walk through trials like i i can honestly honestly say as i look back on those and thank the lord for them like mm -hmm. be thankful because of of getting to know him more and see his face and feel his love and the depth of his word and it just 
you just, you can you can welcome it as a friend like as you've walked through and the lord produces that patience and and you you know in the beginning you're like why am i here you know mm-hmm. but then as you keep going i don't know like you you can embrace it and mm-hmm. and know that the lord is so good yeah mm-hmm. again faithful are the wounds of a friend mm-hmm. but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy mm-hmm. right so yeah that's uh the Lord works in those situations, and we just have to have trust. We have to have faith that, that He is going to bring it about. That he's going to bring it about. I'm going to start to wrap this up. There are a lot of questions. There are many, many questions we didn't get to. However, um, we are going to answer each of those um, individually at a later time, but we're going to just kind of bring this part to uh, a close here. So what we'll do is we'll answer um, another one or two, and then for those that we didn't get to, um, Uh, Maybe I'll get all of us to kind of work on videos for each one of those, so a a little bit of a response, and then that way your question is answered and uh, it is not forgotten. But um, uh, I guess, Rebecca, I'll let you um, get this one. How can we explain these trials, especially what's happening now to our young children? How to find joy even when life is so upside down? Well, I think with children, depending on their age especially, um, is that you speak age appropriately. I don't know. I think keeping it pretty simple for children is good. Trying to get too, um, too deep into words like pandemic and, and other things that are a little bit scary and harder to explain. So I would say, first of all, keep it pretty simple um, that there is this um, illness going around and it's it's such a um, severe one and it's affecting so many people that we want to be safe and so we don't have school and we're going to stay home that kind of thing keeping it simple I think is helpful to explain to children without creating fear in them we don't want them to be afraid and fearful and oh my goodness and and um, we want them to be able to know that it's something that's serious and that is impacting our lives. That's why we're home and not out, but we don't want them to be afraid. Um, and it's a really good opportunity to keep turning them to the Lord mm-hmm. and to be that model for them and saying, hey, we look to Jesus. We know that Jesus loves us. First of all, focusing on the love, focusing on the fact that he's in control and he's going to help us and that we can now be a witness and help others, maybe um, grocery shopping for others, praying for others. Um, that are in our family that need it, uh, those that we know that are sick and dealing with it. So I think that's, that's how I would approach it, really, is, is very simple terms. And um, pointing them to the Lord. What was the second part of the question? Did I, um, did I miss that How to part? find joy even when life is so upside down. Yeah, yeah. And I was just thinking that depending on the age of the children, mm-hmm. what are you doing? Uh, because if I am joyful mm-hmm. and if I'm at peace and taking these circumstances and creating an environment is like, listen, we get, this is like more time to actually, you know, be together and to do these different things. I mean, so I think a lot of it's going to come from mom and dad and the tone that's being set and how you're responding. That's going to be, that's again, that's kind of the thermostat, right? You're setting um, the temperature of the house on joy and you're praising the Lord, and you're thanking the Lord, and you're looking to the Lord, and you're redeeming the time, and don't sit around and watch news all day long Mm. with them or yourself. Um, Mm. You know, so I think, you know, think upon those things that are lovely, those things that are true, those things that are pure, those things that are of good reputation, and um, then engage them in actually praying for the country. This is a great time to raise up a generation of kids that learn how to pray. And so make prayer time a part of your, your day. I mean, teaching them to pray for our, our leaders. And we just talked about that mm-hmm. um, in, our, in, our, in our last study before we um, had all of these changes come. But yeah, just praying for them and, and having hope and, you know, and, and looking for ways and engaging them in the process of saying, hey, what are some ways in which we think God could work here? Mm-hmm. And um, so this is something that we're used to stuff happening fast so this happens we give an answer it's better this happens we get a solution it's better this is not like that so this is going to be one of those seasons that we're going to have to put a little bit of a historical uh, perspective on and so maybe in three months and in six months we're going to come back say all right remember these are all the prayer requests that we wrote down now let's Mm -hmm. go back through and see how god worked Mm -hmm. in a global 
situation and how your prayers were involved. So I think these are some, some good ways to uh, get them involved. The last thing I want to um, just speak on, because I think it is um, an important question, is for those who don't know Jesus, share um, Jesus' view on sickness and why he allows it to come. So why does God allow sickness? Um, Joel, what, what, I mean, is God making sickness happen in people's life? Or how come it exists? I mean, if God created this yeah. world, why do we have it? Well, we have it. And because of the fall, we have it because sin entered the world and um, and sickness and, and death, it entered the world at that point in time. It's something God has allowed. It's not what he desires, but he can, and, and this is the unique thing about God, is that he is the only one who can leverage man's pitfalls and sin, mm. f- even for our own good. So, uh, yes, he allows it. Um, does he send it? I, I don't. Most of the time, I don't think he does. I think, um, yeah. but but he allows things to come. Um, I mean, you have the the pestilences that you see that that uh, in the plagues for for Egypt and so forth. But um, I, as you look through Scripture, I, he doesn't he doesn't do it to to spite someone. He doesn't do it to get back at people. Um, but he allows these things in his sovereignty, and I think that's why we always have that question mark: why? Because it's bad, and in, in, in our minds and our views, um, you know, naturally we think, well, if if he loves us, if he cares for us, why would he let these things happen? Because mm-hmm. the best thing for us is obviously health, um, but th- there's that whole spiritual side of it, which the natural man doesn't understand and doesn't see, yeah. um, which is why it's so important just to share the love of God and and that truth, uh, it it's, might not be easy to accept, but it's the truth, and that truth can can penetrate hearts that, that don't know. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, I was just going to, you know, the first thing that went to my mind is the scripture where uh, the, the story when they, they brought the blind man to Jesus, and they said, who sinned? Yeah. Was it this man or his parents that this guy was born blind? And Jesus was like, neither one, but mm-hmm. that God would be glorified, mm-hmm. right? So God uses it to be... Um, a tool that he might receive glory, and not just through the healing, this, that's possible, but also just through all these things we've been talking about, right? Mm-hmm. It's the spiritual growth, the worship, the maturity, the endurance, and the forbearance that is um, wrought in our lives when we go through these things. But you know what? It's not about who did something wrong. It's about how does God want to get glory? Yeah. Yeah. How does God want to get his name magnified in our lives through these types of things, through whatever the trial is, whether it's physical yeah. Um, or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think these are great answers because God is not, does not find pleasure in the death of, the, mm-hmm. of, of anyone. Um, so he doesn't find pleasure in sickness of, of people. Um, God can heal. God does heal. But the normal course of this world is that we are living in a fallen world. And so every generation passes away. Um, and that's what has been happening for the last 6,000 years. When God created uh, man and placed him in the garden, initially there was no sickness. There was no death because there was no sin. This is what Joel was referring to. So that didn't happen. But when man sinned, then God said, don't eat of the fruit of this, uh, the tree that's in the midst of the garden because in the day that you do that, you will surely die. And at that moment, when man rebelled against God, then death entered to the inner the world. It's the result of sin. Now, one day, for all that put their faith and trust in the Lord, they will be removed from this world that is susceptible to sickness and disease, and heaven will be a place where that does not happen. Presently, we're not living there. Um, presently, obviously, we're very much in touch with um, people that are getting sick um, from this. Uh, COVID-19, but there's a lot of other sicknesses that are far outpacing um, this. More people are getting cancer every day than they are getting this. So there's a lot of things that, that happen, and you know, birth defects and injuries and accidents. And so sometimes God mm-hmm. steps in and interrupts the normal course of events and changes things. But one day, it will all be changed when mm-hmm. the Lord returns and he'll set it up, and there will be no sickness or, or disease. And this is the mistake that some people make is like, well, if God's going to allow sickness and disease, then I want nothing to do with him. Well, first of all, 
he didn't introduce that. That was something that man brought upon himself. Secondly, he's going to do away with it. So you want to be on Team Jesus if you want to be a part of a, a world and an environment and a, and a, a, an age where there is no sickness, death, or disease. So now, today, for believers, we still get sickness, we still have disease, um, we have hard things that happen, but we have the hope that when we pass from this life, we go into the presence of the Lord into that new environment. And so I would try to explain it this way. And if you're an unbeliever, um, listen, come to the Lord. Trials are not just for Christians. <laughs> Some people say, well, I'm not, I don't want more, any more trials, so I'm done with Jesus. <laughs> well, okay. Do, your, do people, do Buddhists not have trials? Do, you know, Muslims not have trials? Do, you know, they all have trials. Mm -hmm. Hard things happen on planet Earth, period. Mm -hmm. So, the question is, do you want the Lord at work in your life in the midst of it? So anyways, thanks for all the questions. We'll get back to those that were asked that we didn't answer. Um, we'll see you tonight um, on Zoom. It'll be a, a either video or an audio call-in platform. And we're just going to pray. We're going to pray together. So hope to see you tonight at 6. Go to cclberg.com slash stay connected or check your email for the invitation link to join that video. Uh, conferencing permitting. God bless you guys.